everyone. Hello and welcome. Um, this event is uh, part of the 2022 International Open Seminar on Semiotics, a uh, tribute to John Dealey uh, on the fifth uh, anniversary of his passing. Um, this event is, uh, just as the, the other series of this part, um, has been collaboratively organized by a wide range of uh, international academic institutions, as well as research associations. For this event today, uh, we are privileged to have a distinct guest speaker from University of Hertfordshire, Professor Daniel uh, Palani. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing uh, that correctly. Professor Daniel Polani, uh, thank you for being uh, with us today. Uh, it's a, a privilege and a pleasure. A few words are in order for Professor um, uh, Polani's uh, background. So, um, Professor Daniel Polani is a um, um, professor of artificial intelligence in the University of uh, Hertfordshire. He is also a director for the Center of uh, uh, Computer Science and Informatics Research, as well as head for the Adaptive Systems Research Group at the same university. At the same time, he is also the leader for the SEPIA lab, which is the Sensor Evolution Processing Information and um, Actuation Lab, um, part of the same uh, Adaptive Systems Research Group at the University of Hertfordshire. Um, Professor Palani uh, has been um, um, has been well known for his work in artificial intelligence, um, his work in cognitive science and robotics, um, applying the tools of um, information theory for cognitive modeling. He is also well known for analyzing um, uh, intelligent uh, agent behavior and decision making in complex adaptive systems and some sensor evolution. So um, of course, uh, in the past decades, Professor Palani has published continuously, but um, uh, we will only cite a few recent publications in some of the distinct uh, journals, like um, uh, the Journal of Physical Review E, Kibernetica, Frontiers in Human Neuroscience, Entropy, Constructivist Foundations, something that Professor Palani mentioned just now, Constructivist, foundations and frontier and the most recent one the frontiers in robotics and ai sounds very exciting so professor Pal uh, palani the the floor is yours thank you very much and i have un I unmute myself and i will now try to share a screen in the hope that this will work can you see my screen Yes. Excellent. Okay, so I am chose to call today's talk uh, basically meaning as the structure of information flows through the world. And I will try to explain what I mean by that. When we talk about information flows, I will talk actually about Shannon information flows. And I will talk about what happens to them when they flow through the world and what does it mean for agents when uh, they have to work with us. And my argument here is that meaning actually emerges through the structure of these flows in various ways, which we are going to discuss today. Okay, so first of all, my thank you goes to a huge amount of people, and I can't even name them all, um, that all have participated in one way or the other in the research I'm talking about here. So it is not a single person or two people, it's a really a whole um, community of people who try to work on this field and uh, who I had the pleasure and honor to work with. Um, so um, basically uh, some of the work will be actually directly cited. Some of it is simply background knowledge that I will mention. And of course, there's several European projects which uh, have been, um, I have been involved in, in in the past years before, of course, the um, uh, exiting of the UK from the European Union, and they had also contributed a lot uh, to our work. Anyway, so let's move on and let me come to my main argument. So the way I like to look at, at this topic is the question of where does intelligence and cognition come from? Well, we can, if we look at 
nature. We try as a scientific outlook to understand can cognition emerge from an evolutionary basis, which means a process that does not have intelligence in its, itself. There's not much intelligence in the, in the evolutionary process. And can nevertheless, that relatively unintelligent process, I will not call it stupid, it's not stupid, but it's it's unintelligent. There's not, no, not an entity sitting there and putting things together, at least that's kind of the common uh, consensus in the scientific realm. And can that help us understand how intelligence can emerge? And the argument is that there are actually a lot of things that come together when you look at evolutionary processes that make this, that conspire to make this work even without evolution itself having to be intelligent on it, in intelligent in its own right. So let me be a little bit more concrete. So we are asking what drives the evolution of cognition, right? So this is the main question that we are asking. And I will argue that this is also the key. Answering this question is the key to answer the question of meaning. So what we observe, this is pure observation now, that sensory motor and cognitive abilities appear in disparate lines of descent. So they do reappear in nature, even if the evolutionary lines are quite independent. And let me look at sensors especially. So we know that photoreceptors appear in 40 to 60 lines of descent of which it's estimated that four to six of them are completely independent. In other words, photoreception, vision, has been rediscovered in nature across the board in completely different contexts. And if you look at very far away um, organisms like us, mammals, and octopuses, they are very far away. We split off from octopuses probably 400 million years ago, something around this area. And nevertheless, the visual system looks quite similar in many respects, at least macroanatomics, to ours. Microanatomics, not. The details are very different, but the functionality of it is quite similar to ours. We have some other examples. For example, you have analog modalities in other mechanisms. So, for example, snakes have an infrared sensor that is completely built on a completely different um, body uh, body scheme. It, it lives on different parts of the body scheme. It's a, actually a very interesting long story, but the interesting part is that it's treated like a visual modality. The infrared sense of snake, snakes is actually matched up with the visual sense and the, the optical tectum, which means that they're both treated in the same modality, although the sensor, the sensoric substrate is completely different. And funnily enough, that sonar that sonar is actually an auditory sense, you would think, but it actually is treated as closer in, in treatment to the modality of vision because it treats objects like visual objects located at certain locations in space. I would like also to talk about intelligence itself. So mammals are intelligent. Many mammals we know are intelligent. We believe are intelligent. Uh, it's not just um, primates. It could be elephants. It could be... Um, it could be... Um, uh, cetaceans, so, so whales and dolphins. Birds are intelligent. If you look at uh, birds, they are quite far away from us, not as far as octopuses go, but um, if you look at gray uh, parrots, um, African greys, they are actually incredibly intelligent animals. And it is, it is very clear that intelligent or ravens, that intelligence can appear in different guises with different embodiments, different bodies and different niches. And of course, my favorite animal, the octopus, which is surprisingly uh, smart. And the, some people say the only reason that kept uh, octopuses from in developing into a higher intelligence like humans is their short lifespan. Mm -hmm. They just live two and three years old mm -hmm. to become two, three years old. That's not enough to develop a whole social structure. Maybe they could do further, but get further if, if they had a more uh, a higher longevity. So, what we find is we see a convergence, a convergence of different expressions of intelligence into similar type of outcomes. And that means evolution is not that random. It not, doesn't just go out and just explore random parts. There seems to be something that keeps it on track to evolve commonalities. So the question is, where do these commonalities come from? 
And can we say something about them? Can we identify them? Can we say, okay, what do all these developments have in common? So let us start with a very simple example to give you an idea um, what evolution likes to do. So evolution is something that seems undirected, unstructured, um, random. That's kind of the polemic way of looking at Darwinian evolution. But Darwin was actually much smarter. He understood that the evolution is not just random. There's a lot of structure in evolution. And I won't go into too much detail, but I'll give you an example of how a very simple idea can give rise to a lot of power. So let's look at the fly. Flies are strange animals in the sense that, you know, they're very simple. They don't learn anything as far as we know. They don't learn anything, but they are perfectly adapted to their niche. In a, in a way, a fly is almost a perfect organism. Um, it's just optimally adapted to the niche it lives in. There's nothing to evolve further. Um, and the interesting part about the fly is that the eye does a lot of work that the brain usually does. And we can see that when we look at the eyes, well, there's an old joke from, um, you know, the, Grimm's uh, tales, grandmother, what big eyes, what big ears you have, what big teeth you have. But here in the case of the fly, it's the eyes that are really big. And there's a reason for that. So why does the fly have these big eyes? Well, to compute the optical flow. So the optical flow is a quantity that emerges in the moment that you have a structured eye. We'll come later to how you get, get structured, structured eyes. Um, and it allows the fly to do a lot of things that it needs to do. So let's have a look. What is the optical flaw? Imagine you're driving a car through the desert. And when the desert is quite unstructured, there's just a flat plane, you drive this car on the road and you don't observe what's going on. All you observe is flow of objects. So there's a cactus or a plant or some, some dirt on the, on the street and it moves. And as it moves, it creates a vector field. So you see a field of movement um, in your visual field. And uh, here is a sketch of how that may look like. So you drive on this road and you see that the objects move and you don't actually care about the objects themselves. It doesn't matter to you what the objects are, what you care about is that they move and how they move. And if you see these vectors of movements, you see this vector field, it has a couple of properties. First of all, the movements are straight lines. This is interesting and they, they focus on a certain point. So this is the point you move towards. The other striking thing is that the vector field abruptly ends at the horizon and above there's no movement. So essentially, by checking just the movement, you don't do any optic recognition, you just track the movement. You know that you're moving towards the point, the center point of these uh, vector fields where the vector fields actually converge. So you move to this area and you know that whatever is above is very far away or you can't uh, detect any movement. So you move on the ground, there's a ground and you move towards this direction. This is, you can compute just by the optical flow. Now, when you look at this one, this is now um, optical flow when you are turning. So you're turning down. So you are flying, you're flying down. Then this is essentially um, a vector field that where the arrows don't go to the straight, to straight in front of you, but they are actually turned around. And this is indicating that you're making a turning movement. In fact, Human pilots use optical flow also for landing. They, they fixate a point on the ground and try to um, get the optical flow in their eyes. Now, human eyes are not ideal for optical flow, but fly eyes are. And so what the fly eye does, it doesn't care about recognizing objects. Bees may do want to recognize objects, but fly don't care. Flies don't care too much. They care only about the flow. And when they do so, they can use it to do various operations. And here I'll show you how you do use it for landing. So let's assume here's a fly. I'm, I'm really sorry about the uh, painting. This, is, uh, this figure is really rubbish. But I made it myself, so, so I apologize for that. I'm really not, not a great artist. And the fly, basically, when it flies at a level far away from the ground, here's the ground, and these little sticks are basically signaling, uh, symbolizing some objects on the ground. Uh, they, it doesn't really matter what they are, right? There's just an identifiable object that 
that, that moves relative to the fly. So as it moves relative to the fly, the fly, as a fly moves at a certain height, it sees that object at this location. When it moves at a certain speed, after a while, it sees the object at a different angle. The object relative to the fly has moved down. So there's a flow which the fly sees. Now, when the fly wants to land, it reduces the energy of its wings and it basically approaches the ground. And what happens now is that what the fly will try to do, this the hypothesis uh, about how they land, it will try to keep the optical flow constant. So it goes closer to the ground, but now it is no longer um, that far away. So when the optical flow is constant, the fly will automatically become slower. And when it approaches the ground, it gets slower and slower and slower. So all the fly needs to do to land nicely, more or less, is to keep the optical flow constant and reduce the height. So the fly doesn't have to do any complicated calculations, just keeps the optical flow constant, more or less, and goes closer to the ground. That is all. And this basically gives the fly a very easy access to the concept of landing. So it doesn't need to have very complicated control routines. It has the right way of looking at the environment. And this is something that we see in nature over and over. I mean, it's of course a simplified picture of what happens, but it is essentially the idea that whatever happens around you depends on your embodiment, your sensors, your actuators, and evolution evolves them to have a little effort in processing, to not have to do too much of extra computation once the data has been acquired by the sensor and is being led to the actuators. So what we observe here is we have minimal design. Minimal design is you just need to compute optical flow. Note that the fly can also compute rotations and um, so yaw and a roll and, and, um, and essentially um, um, pitch on the flight using, using the optical flow. It does not need to recognize anything. It doesn't need an object recognition, which we all, as humans, always talk about object recognition. You can get very far without any object recognition. This is what I'm trying to explain. So we may actually not care about objects. A fly cares about the smell of stuff, so it will land on uh, the garbage heap in the, on the road. It will land on your sandwich. It will land on your face. And for, for the fly, it's all the same. In terms of book skill, um, I haven't this picture here, but I have a, you know, you can imagine in terms of book school for the fly, anything that smells, you know, interesting, uh, food-like um, is int an interesting place. For humans, of course, we have a different opinion of what, what's attractive. Now, it's simple and consistent. And if you look at the fly, it actually only needs 300,000 euros. That is not a lot. It, it's much more than fruit flies, which are simpler. They, they have something like 30 to 50,000 units, but it's still not a lot, right? If you look at bees, which are use social insects, they have something like a million units, so clearly more. And they need them because they need to recognize objects and then remember things. The world model of the fly is very simple. Yeah, it, it needs a place to land, it needs a place to fly, it, it smells food and, and there's mating and uh, fleeing, and, and there's not much more than a fly needs to do. And the fly eye does most of the job. So in fact, you can say that much of the fly's brain power has been already outsourced to the eye that does a lot of the jobs that the fly needs to do. So it is simple and it's cheap. Well, it's simple, yes, but cheap is, a, is an issue. Well, because if you look at the fly eye, utilization of energy, you find that it's actually using up to the 20% of the total metabolic energy of the, fly, of the whole fly. So the eye actually, you pay 20% tax to run the eye. And interestingly, if you look at humans, we pay roughly 20% metabolic tax to run our brain. So basically the fly's eye uses as much energy relative to the whole in but the metabolics as the whole as the human brain so it's really important and it is a lot of energy so the question is why do we do that so what's the lesson learned from here well you see um i i will i will here um make a 
make a, a Latin uh, a pseudo Latin statement. Natura non facit expensum sine necessitate. Nature does not make any expenses unless it's necessary. So whenever it's not necessary, you can evolve it away or you can exploit it better. So if it's not necessary, either you make use of this extra resource or you make sure that you don't use it. That is kind of what we can assume. It's not perfect. It's not a perfect optimizer, but it really doesn't want to waste energy if it can avoid that. Um, so it's clear that the role of IAP is central for the fly. And what does it do? It, it captures information about the environment. So the fly's eye gets something about the environment. And what's more important, and I uh, mentioned that this optical flow can be directly convert, converted into action. So when the fly is landing, we said, well, we use optical flow, we keep it constant, and then, then we can land essentially by just keeping it constant. So it makes this information directly exploitable to whatever action needs to be taken. In this case, landing, we can think of turning and other maneuvers. The optical flow is what the fly uses to direct its maneuvers directly. So what matters is what comes out at the end. Um, this is a famous saying by a former uh, chancellor, um, the former chancellor of, of Germany, Helmut Kohl, and the, the way he said it was sounded very weird because um, when a guy that looks like a big baby says that, it's a little bit, um, uh, it is, um, ha has quite some connotation. The interesting part of that is that we have now to ask, what does it mean? What matters? What comes out at the end? And uh, to do that, I want now to go to a more formal part of my talk and try to understand the things we're talking about in terms of the language that I'm going to use henceforth throughout the talk, namely the language of Shannon information. So let me look at a very minimal example, so trivial that people say, okay, what is there in this example? And I will try to convince you that this example actually already contains a lot of features that teach us something about what agents may want to do in an environment. So let us uh, have a look. Here is a world, and this world is grid world, and this, uh, I think, is 11 times 11, or probably it's bigger, it's 21 times 21, something like that. In this grid world, we have a chemical, and the chemical is concentrated here, but its strength diffuses out uh, to the neighboring cells. The chemical has no temporal structure. So essentially, the chemical diffusion level is fixed as in this picture. It's not changing over time. It's, um, this will just complicate our problem without adding anything. So in this world, we put an agent and this agent can go to the north, east, south, or west. So the agent has four actions that can choose. And we now can do the following. We make this agent go towards the chemical. So it will just camo taxes. It will pick the sensor um, that points to the highest concentration of the chemical. So for example, up, right, right, up, right, up, right, up, right, up, up, until it gets to the center. That's, that's essentially what our agent is going to do. Very simple, very un uninteresting agent. What we are going to do now is to ask the following question. How much information can the agent capture about where it started in the beginning at most? So we have an agent. This agent does the, follows the chem in Texas. So it follows the rule, but it can observe. And we want to capture as much information about its original state. So at the end of the run, when the agent is in the center, we will look at the agent or after 15 steps, in fact, and we, it, we don't even require the agent to be at the center. For 15 steps, we look at the agent's memory and ask how much information does the memory capture about the initial state where it was in the world. And this information is measured in terms of Shannon information. So it's measured in bits. It is a formal quantity. And how do we do this? OK, this is how we do that. Um, I have here a diagram, which is a so-called Bayesian network. Um, formally, this is essentially this, um, describing a probability distribution of all the possible locations of the agent in the world, the sensor state of the agent, the accurate state, and the memory state of the world. Um, if you don't want to think in terms of probabilities, just think of it as terms of variables. It's really not so important. And think of the following. So you have the world, 
and the world at a certain time, say time t minus three. That's time t minus three, whatever t is, you pick some time t. This is the world state. And this world state impinges on the center. So if the agent is south of the center of the world, the agent will see that its sensors, they have four sensors, and it will point to the north. It will say to the north is the highest gradient. So the sensor state is north, for example. So this sensor state now impinges on the action. Let's forget the memory for a second. I'll explain that in a sec. So the sensor impinges on the action. That we said that the agent does chemotaxis, so the agent will pick the action that goes north. That is the direction of the highest increase of the chemical gradient. So the sensor state will affect the actor agent, and the actor will pick the action go north, and that is an arrow that creates a new world state, of course, independent also of the old world state. So in the old world state, you were in a certain location with the action north, this old world location becomes a new world location, namely the world location one step to the north. Okay, so the old world location and the action together decide the new world state. And we repeat that cycle, we observe the sensor again, we do an action, we get a new world state and so on. So, so this is essentially a perception action loop unrolled in time so that we can see at each time what happens. And this distribution, this is essentially modeling a probability distribution of where we are and what we do. And this probability distribution is necessary if we want to talk about mutual information, if we want to talk about channel information, you have to talk about probability of one event, for example, starting at a certain location and another event and what the other event is, is looking at the memory, having a particular state at the end of our run. And this information is then uh, telling me how much does the memory know about where we start. And here is the memory I mentioned uh, that I would look at it later. Now we are looking at it. The memory is simply some kind of part of the brain of the agent, which is affected by what you observe. And it's affected also, um, could be affected by the actions, not in this case, you could affect it by the actions, but we don't do that. So it observes a state, state, uh, sensor, 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 and it is also collecting old information. So basically it summarizes all the sensor information of the past. And now what we are going to evolve is these arrows here, these two arrows. So these two arrows essentially, uh, tell us how the information about the sensor is incorporated into the memory and what it actually does in choosing the actions. So this cycle here is just what the agent does, but here the memory is essentially telling us, um, is, is collecting information by the sensor from the sensor in a way that will maximize the information about the starting state that we will collect at the end of the run. In other words, we run the agent, we don't know where it is, but we now look at the memory and say, where have you started? And we maximize this. And when we do so, there are interesting patterns that emerge. So for example, if you have a memory of size two, so there are two memory states. So at the end, you get to two, um, two cells. And we have here the gradient flow, so that follows the chemical gradient. And when we do this, um, the agent is in one of the two states at the end. Right, and we look at the state, say state two, this is state two, and then basically the memory tells us that we started in one of these stripes. So the stripes are black means high probability. So high probability means with high probability we started on one of the stripe, with a zero probability we started on the on the white stripes, and with um, half probability we, we are on these diagonal diagonal um, uh, side stripes of the of the middle stripes. This is okay, this is what you get. Um, if we give the memory a little bit more space, uh, three states, um, the stripes are a bit clearer and the areas of, of no probability, of zero probability are wider. And I should mention that if you add the probabilities up at each location for the three states, this will be one, right? So the memory, there's always one memory state that's being active. Now, um, in memory four, it's actually um, when you're in four states, we get a new, new, um, uh, new quality. And you basically get 
now a split of the world into a lower diagonal and an upper diagonal, uh, upper triangle, and a, a, again, a lower triangle. So lower triangle, if you look at these two lower triangles, they're pretty identical. But this is an upper triangle, and this is an, another lower triangle, which is complementary to these. So this or this triangle, they're not complementary. So you essentially get a checkerboard. So it tells you you're in the lower right triangle, but there are two types of this lower right triangle. There's even and uneven. So it split essentially the concept of a lower triangle into even and uneven. It did not do that for the upper triangle. This is emerged from the evolution, from the optimization. So it doesn't have to be this way. It could be the other way around. There are many solutions, but this is one of the solutions that emerged. So upper triangle is just one blob, but the lower, the lower triangle is actually split in an even and an odd part. When you increase memory further, the system can become even more um, capable of splitting up. And we see upper, upper square, lower square. And in the lowest and upper square, again, this upper square, these two upper squares are equivalent. But again, we have odd and even upper square and odd and even. So it's, again, two types of, of checkerboards in the lower square. You see that without us telling the system anything, it has categorized its environment, its initial state, which is the square of 11 times 11 things. It has categorized them into north and south and odd and even. So we have essentially four categories in which it has split it up effectively. We have no demand on it. We just demanded that it maximizes information, nothing else. We did not ask it how to characterize it naturally. Now, these checkerboard patterns emerge because essentially our poor agent can only observe. It, it has to follow the chemical bracket, right? It cannot, it cannot um, choose. It can choose what it's doing, but it has to, the, the observer, the part that learns the memory is like an embedded journalist. It travels with the, with the convoy. It, it travels with the agent, but it cannot choose what to do. Now, if we permit the agent to choose the actions, so we give the agent more power to actually extract, where did I start from? Then it gets even more interest. Here's the agent when we do not constrain the actions anymore. The agent is now not only allowed to remember what it wants, it's also allowed to choose actions to extract more information about where it started. And you see that the worlds here are much nicer structured. So if you have two memory states, you see south, the, the, the lower triangle, upper triangle, they're very clean, very clean. This and this, this is a split that the agent discovers itself. It's not something we impose, it's just maximize information about the start. If you have three, it's even nice. You see that it, we get a much nicer solution against not these, these diagonals, but you get basically upper, upper, so northeast, southeast, and essentially west plus a stripe in the middle, which hadn't been resolved between these two, right? So you get essentially this west and the middle uh, structure. When you go to four, because the world has four, four, um, fourfold symmetry, the, the the structure is even more striking. You have upper triangle, western triangle, southern, and eastern triangle. When I do eight, there's a reason why I go to through details here because the, the next point that I'm going to make is very critically linked to, to understanding this. When I go to eight states, I get again um, eastern triangle, western triangle, now a southern triangle, which is actually split into uh, odd and even. Right, so um, you hear odd and even. So the southern triangle is not just split, not just one triangle, but actually the, the agent has so many memory states that it permits itself to say, okay, I can have actually two classes of these, of these triangles, um, not just one triangle. It distinguishes two types of southern triangles. And of course, the, the western triangle. So these are well known for before, but it has enough memory to split the southern triangle. Could be any of the others too. Right? We don't know which one it will split, but it has decided that it can distinguish these two. Um, and of course, what we see additionally, we see additional structure in the diagonals. It starts now talking about diagonals. Well, I say talking, there's a concept in the memory that belongs to the diagonal, not to the upper triangle, not to any of the triangles, belongs to the diagonals. So the agent has discovered the concept of diagonals. 
Now, when we look at this agent, you see that this is not perfectly symmetric. The world is symmetric, but the agent is not. So the agent has broken the symmetry slightly. There is some similarity between triangles, but there's a, but again, it's broken a bit because the southern triangle is split differently. So you could imagine that I now create a new agent that does the same thing, but finds different splits. It finds slightly different triangles, and it decides to split the northern triangle instead of the southern triangle being split in odd and even, it splits the northern triangle. Now imagine that these two agents talk to each other. So as long as they talk about whole triangles, there's no problem. But when the northern triangle talks about, oh, the odd northern triangle, the southern triangle, uh, the agent with the southern triangle split will say, what, what are you talking about? I don't understand what you're talking about. It's a distinction I don't have. I don't know, I, I can't distinguish this. We see that in languages, um, often you have this concept of where people talk and everything is clear and suddenly somebody makes a distinction you say oh uh, I didn't know that is a different thing um, and in our language we don't distinguish it these are the same objects essentially now here this is not this is proto language it's not really language but the concepts already show that despite the world being identical these two agents may have some agreements on what they talk about or what, what concepts they identify and some things where they don't agree, where there's no way for them to understand the other agent's concept. And this is obviously very related to, to, to the topic of, of uh, the seminar series. And so I want to, well, I'll skip that one. That's not so important, it's a machine. I'll, I'll skip that one. Um, I want to, um, discuss it a little bit more. So we talk about these two agents, what happens if they have different concepts that emerge? So first of all, let's understand where the concepts come from. If you look at the, at the space, it's a chemotactical uh, area, and we know what the agent is doing. So that what the agent is doing, the agent has preferred actions. In the upper triangle, the optimal action is going down. And this is the action that the agent will do when it follows the chemical gradient. In the Eastern triangle, um, it's the going to the west, in the western triangle, going to the east, and so on. So the actions that the agent can pick determine the triangles. The diagonals now are special points where the actions are not unique anymore, because the agent can pick either east or north in the diagonal. Both actions are equally likely in the chemical gradient scenario. And finally, the center is extra special because in the center, you just go in one direction. The agent doesn't have a stop action. I didn't mention that. But the agent doesn't have a stop action. So the agent must make a move and will take a random move in the center because there's no preferred direction. Okay, so we understand now where the different concepts of the worlds come from. They actually come from the fact that certain actions are preferred in a particular part of the world. However, now, Let's do the thing with the multiple agents again. And now it gets interesting. So we again have take agents and let them run and let's let them extract information optimally. Again, we don't demand that they learn concepts. All we say, your memory state needs to be able to say as accurately as possible where you started. And so we use um, eight memories, eight memory states, so three bits. And the agent, say, gets an upper triangle, uh, western triangle, eastern triangle, southern triangle, and four di diagonals. And you see the diagonals are not exactly identical. They're a little bit, uh, some are thicker, some are smaller. Now, this is imperfect. And if you run it again with a different agent, it gets slightly different splits. So um, what, what can I do with this? Well. In other words, what, 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 I, clearly the agents have some uh, subjective uh, experiences, spiritual history to cause the outcome. Now, what I can do is a follow. This is a paper that I did with uh, Marco Miller. Um, and with this paper, we ask the question, is there something objective that all the agents are completely subjective and have learned their own concepts? Is there something objective we can say? And there are two ways of doing that. Uh, I'll show you both ways, but essentially the results look very similar for both. So one is what we call the objective concept formation. So each agent has the concept. Um, so uh, agent one, two, three, four, five, they all have these concepts. 
And we now force the agent to talk together. What exactly does it mean? What we say is we want that there is some kind of joint concept. Think of it as a super agent, something that hovers above the agents, hovers above the waters, and tries to capture as much as possible about what each agent says. So we try to have the super agent that understands everything. Think of language or uh, institution or the Academy of Sciences or Academy Francaise uh, that decides what, what the language um, is supposed to look like. And we can do that either filtering that through the real world, R is a real world. I, I, unfortunately, I'm not consistent with the naming of the variables. So this should be the W, like the world, so the real world. So essentially, this one is allowed to look at the mutual information of the concept, but only with respect to what actually exists. We call it the objective concept formation. It's basically like a scientific process under which every concept is treated. So if any of them is superstitious and sees ghosts and spirits, this is not passing the reality test. The other concept that we tried is um, passing them, so this is the real world, each agent has a concept, and now we create a subjective joint concept. So it's not actually filtered through the world. And we call that the subjective concept formation. And we essentially wanted to check whether superstition is forming. Basically, the agent can come up with some kind of stuff that doesn't exist, but everybody agrees that this is something that they want to talk about, even if it's not actually grounded in the world. So this is what we thought would happen. It turned out in that study, at least in that model we had, we did not get any superstition. Um, so clearly you need more um, intricate um, models for the emergence of superstition of non-existing or non, not really existing concepts in the minds of your agents. The important part, however, is this. You have lots of agents and we force a joint variable that is extracting as much as possible of this information um, from um, in, in compressing it into one variable. There are formulas that you can use. It's essentially an information bottleneck. Um, here, I basically am not going to spend too much time on that. Um, I just, just give you the equations so you can see where it comes from. So the first one corresponds to the following uh, objective function, basically says mutual information between the objective concepts and the individual concepts added over all the agents minus um, a penalty for not getting uh, for not getting the information um, this information uh, I don't want any information about the world that's not in the agents okay so this alpha is a factor it's a Lagrangian factor that controls how much you want to suppress the extra information that R has I don't want this objective concept to talk about R in terms that are not captured by the, the individual agents so um, you know otherwise uh, this one just would be a copy of R Right, you just copy the real world and then you're good, but you don't want to copy the real world. You want only to copy those parts of the real world which actually appear in the individual agents. And this is the reflected by the choice of the Lagrangian parameter alpha. When it's high, it means I want to really suppress any information that's not in the individual agents. Here, with the subjective case, is uh, even easier. We don't care about R at all because if they, they come up with a superstition that everybody's sharing that is an illegitimate subjective concept and we want simply to maximize the mutual information of all the variables with a subjective variable that's basically what you want to do okay when you do that something very interesting happens so here we have um one agent and uh, we look at an agent agents with four states so two bits so each agent has a kind of categorization in east south, west, north. This is all we have. So we have only triangles as categorizations by the individual agents. But now, the interesting part is when you force it to join concepts according to this bottleneck, you ask, I want to extract the subjective information, the objective information, the results are essentially the same, um, turn out to be. What is the subjective concept, joint concept, that maximizes what I can extract from all agents. What happens is we get something like this here. You can see this variable this is a subjective concept. And you see several of the cells are completely unoccupied. These are cells where basically this is a concept that was not ever, um, was not actually occupied. It was not um, 
was not um, defined. So this concept has never been used. So we only look at the ones where we have black cells. And so we get north, east, south, that's, no, sorry, northwest, east, and south. These are concepts that we are not really surprised about because, of course, each of the agents had that. But if you will pay very close attention, you will see that the diagonals are treated differently by each agent. Remember, the diagonals are only seen once you have more than four states. Yeah, you need, you need basically um, six, six or more states to see the diagonals as a separate concept. And so essentially the diagonal, it's not clear when the diagonal does or not, does not belong to the triangle. We see here that first of all, all the concepts of North East Southwest are exactly symmetric. So if you turn them around, they match perfectly. Not only that, you suddenly get the diagonals and you don't get them as a wobbly fat line. You get them as a very precise and accurate uh, um, concept, very clean, very crisp and perfectly symmetric. And more than that, you get a concept that you never get with an individual agent. We never managed to get it with an individual agent, and that's this one. You see, the concept that emerges by forcing them to talk in the same uh, language or extract the information into the joint variable is the center of the world. No agent, we tried a lot of evolution, no agent ever discovered that on its own. So this concept of the center of the world is a separate concept and merges only when the agents are forced to basically um, to get all the concepts together in one big joint subjective or objective concept. So one idea here is when we talk about semiotics, and I'm, I'm not at semiotics yet, but I'm, I'm trying to approach that, that once you have agents that have individual and subjective concepts, which are more or less clean, they're not super clean. You force them to talk, suddenly the concepts become much crisper, much more symmetric, much more uh, abstractable, and you get the concepts that you didn't have before. So in other words, the reason you are able to do mathematics as a human maybe is a reason because we have to communicate. Maybe an individual human could understand mathematics and could understand intuitively how to do things. But if they are not forced to communicate, they're not forced to form crisp concepts. Crispicity of concepts, cleanliness of concepts may be actually enforced by the necessity of having to communicate to other agents under a limited and constrained channel. So this is the first hypothesis I would like to make here. And the argument is that once you have a very crisp channel, a very, very um, constrained channel, limit capacity, you have to be very crisp and you are actually encouraged to create transferable and more abstract and structured concepts. Maybe this is the secret of why language works and why mathematics works, because we are forced to communicate under very, very tightly constrained channel. So this is the first thing I wanted to talk to you about. And I, I put it at the beginning with, because this was really something I needed to get here, to you. So uh, let me, let me um, uh, summarize some of the observation of this study. So common concepts are more structured and symmetric than individual ones. This seems to be quite generally the case. The novel concept of the center of the world, for example, is not available to the individual either. Right? So we discovered a concept that is never emerging on an individual. You only find it when you talk to others. And third, this is something that I, I don't have time to explain too much in detail how we did that, but essentially you can now take the individual agents and re-educate them to talk, to reconstruct the concepts that were acquired in the joint in the joint uh, uh, um, uh, description. So in other words, you can take the agents and with relatively little effort, you can make them understand the concept. And this would be something like downward causality in a way, not really causal, but it would allow agents to then converge more cleanly on a crisper way of describing the world. And so this is the interaction between agents, create concept concepts, form the agents uh, mental image and vice versa. And so this can bounce back and forth and not in this simple example, it will not, but in a more interesting, complicated example it may. So you have the outer world interacts on the inner model. The inner model creates some kind of language and the language basically is defined on this inner model through linking it 
with other agents in their worlds. Um, the interesting part here is nothing here was a priori. It all emerged through the interaction of the agent with the world. So the information concepts are not a priori, they're only implicit in the world. You have a different world, you get different concepts, and there's nobody needed to tell you what the concepts are. All that you do is information optimization. And with this, I, I move to second part of my talk. And um, one of the things I want to say is the world carries a lot of implicit structure. And I want to start with some striking examples and then give an idea of how this implicit structure may actually generate meaning that's otherwise not easy to see. So here's a little example. And um, some of you may know Franz Kafka's story of the metamorphosis where this guy wakes up and he wakes up in the body of a huge insect, uh, a roach probably. Um, in this experiment, we do something similar, um, but we, uh, we uh, have modified the initial statement of Kafka stories. As one day Gregor Samsai awoke from inquired dreams, he found himself transformed into a monstrous Ibo. So an Ibo is of course this uh, little robotic dog. And the point is when you awake in a completely different body, um, what's happened to your, what happened to your wiring, right? So we are born and we can see kind of, we can create all these structures, but what happens to your wiring when you didn't have that, right? So um, what, how did you get the correct wiring of the location, locations on your retina to the right location to the brain in the first place? So here we have an informational model for that. So first of all, let's look at the setup. So we have a retina and the retina takes in inputs and the inputs are say transferred to any random location somewhere in the brain's cortex. There's no structure a priori. There's no reason for such structure. You don't have the capacity in your genome to encode that mapping. That mapping cannot be encoded in the genome. So how do we actually get that right? So the way to do that, one way to do that is for example, using information or essentially information statistics. So imagine you have this retina and you scramble it completely. And when you scramble it, you get um, pictures like that. I will uh, run in a second. This is actually the original. So this would be the original if it's not scrambled. When you scramble, it looks like that. Can we reconstruct it? And we, you can, we can. So what you can do is saying the following. You say, okay, uh, look at two pixels, look at their data streams. And these data streams have a statistics. And the statistics allows me to look at the mutual information or the mutual information distance between these streams. So it's basically, you can use an entropy distance uh, between these streams and basically the, the, the symmetric difference of the entropy of the entropies. And that distance is essentially large if they are very different and it's small when they're very similar. When you run this, you can say, okay, two fields that have a, are close by or have low distance should be close. Two fields that are very different, very far away from each other should be far away. So you try to map the information statistics into a two-dimensional two space. And when you do that, you can reconstruct the behavior. Let's see where it's starting it. No. So you should be able to see the movie. So this is the world that we see. This is a scramble world that's really an uninformative, but this is the reconstructed world. You see it's not perfect. You don't see exactly the right structure of the world, but you see contiguous areas, you see blobs, you see lines, and you can imagine that the informational structure itself, no, it doesn't know anything about the world outside. It has no idea oh, that this is a wall or this is a shelf or these are books. All it knows is that these areas have similar statistics and they're grouped together. And so just that is enough already to get you a hint how to put all these cells into a similar location, right? So this is work by, by the way, by Lars also. And, um, and this shows us that statistics already contains a lot of information. Now you could say additional statistics, like what happens when I'm moving in a certain way and then 
adding that information in gets you a little bit more structure like this, uh, continuous lines or, or kinetic kinetic directions, which are preferred to, to remember. Okay, let, let me kill this one. Um, so. No, I want just to kill that. Okay, let, let's never mind. So we can do even more than that. You can take the uh, input stream and just plot it on a two-dimensional uh, on a two-dimensional field. And when you do that here, you can see what happens. Then you see that that this stream coming from the eyeball, every sense of the eyeball, you have no idea what they are, right? They're, they're just streams of information. They have no meaning, no structure, nothing. But you can already see that they can be by organizing them by distance, you see a couple of things. First of all, you see bilateral symmetry. Second, you see this area here. You can guess that this area is actually the visual field, okay? Then you see some, some things that are really blocked together. They don't distinguish them much, but there are things that are far away from each other. And things that are far away from each other, you will find out that they are basically forward uh, legs and, and different legs. And you see essentially bilateral symmetry. You have no idea that this agent is bilateral symmetric, but you can already guess it from just looking at the distance. And you can, of course, organize how the different uh, information flows are actually uh, related to each other just by looking at the statistics. OK. No, I didn't want to click on this. I just wanted to go down. Sorry. And here is an, a, a, a cruel experiment that has been done with cats. They have been placed in the in a, in a, in the phase where the eyes develop in a cage where there were only vertical or horizontal lines. And basically, these cats did not develop the visual ability to distinguish the other type of lines. So if in vertical lines, it could not live in an environment with horizontal lines because it would not develop the ability to distinguish them. We can do the same thing with robots. Um, it's, um, it's also a cruel experiment, but the advantage is we can undo it. Here's an example. We grow the robot in, in, in this uh, vertical line environment, and you see that you get these lines and the separate groups of, of sensors that have nothing to do with each other. And now we put the robot back in an environment where the statistics is actually full, where there are not just lines, there are also horizontal, horizontal lines. And when you see that the robot learns the new statistics, um, that will come in a second, then the robot is now able, you see now the statistics fix it, fixes it, it and we get um, essentially an area that is an equally, more or less equally distributed field of vision in the two-dimensional field. So essentially when you start this thing, it is uh, split up into these different lines and in between they cannot be compared and then you move towards the fully, um, fully, um, fully distributed field. So what we have seen here is that you can essentially use the environment to create structure in your, in your perception of the world. You don't need any instructor. You don't need to be any, anything to tell you how to do that. Just the statistics is enough to do this. And this is a key to understand how we can adapt ourselves to the world around us. Now, I want to come to the final main block of, of my, my um, talk and now saying, okay, we talk about maximize information. Okay, why ever do you want to do that? It's not clear. Why is maximizing information a good thing? There are reasons for that. There are lots of things that we can say about that. Um, the second thing is where how we using information to structure, to structure, the, tr structure how your sensory uh, motor apparatus uh, looks like. We talked about that. But actually, what generates meaning in the first place? And this is a big question. So when you have a robot and you want the robot to do something, a task, the meaning is imposed by the engineer. The engineer says, bring me my beer. Bring me my book. Um, clean the floor. This is a task the engineer decides. And that is, of course, a clear task. It's imposed externally. Uh, no discussion about that. But the question is, can we have meaning emerge internally? And of course, the classic answer to that would be if we take a Darwinian evolutionary outlook is, well, meaning is what emerges from evolution, right? You, you pay attention to the things that increase your survival. 
If you do the things that increase your survival, these are things you care to distinguish. So think of a fly. The fly doesn't care to distinguish about garbage, garbage heap, your sandwich, your face. It's food. And, and for the fly, all of this has meaning of food. Um, for humans, of course, it doesn't, right? So, so food is food is a sandwich and the garbage heap is garbage heap. Um, we distinguish them. So for us, the meaning is this is what we want. The problem with that is that, of course, food is a relatively simple thing, but there are many things where the meaning emerges and it's not that obvious where it comes from, uh, especially for complex organisms. So if you're a very simple organism, you probably just, you know, it's food or it's an uh, enemy and, 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 and it's mating and, and, and that's it. There's not much more here. Um, but if we look at the big picture, we, it turns out that the space is too big to be handled that way. So let me just um, um, give you a, a motivation here. So in biology, the success criterion is survival. Okay, so meaning is determined by survival. That is a, that is a stark Darwinian view of things. Um, in particular, the concept of what is a task and what is a reward, a concept that is well-defined in artificial intelligence, but it's not well-defined in biology, that concept is not sharp in evolution. Not sharp at all. It's not really clear how to define it. What's worse, the search space that we are living in in evolution is sparse and it is large. So there's the few solutions that work and it's very, very large. And you have to be able to find, jump from one viable solution to another. If you fail to do that, you're dead or your, your, your offspring is dead. So if you do predominant Pure Darwinism, naive Darwinism, let's call it this way. Darwin himself was not that naive. He was actually quite circumspect in his argument. But if you adopt a naive Darwinistic approach, feedback comes by death. So you do something wrong, you die. That's it. And, and that, that's all there is to meaning. Um, that's, of course, not very helpful because let's assume we get everything right and you make one mistake and you're dead. So it's very clear organisms don't do that. They, they make mistakes and they do die, but it's far less than you would expect just by chance. They are far better, doing far better than chance in terms of survival. So the question is, why does it work? So one answer that you'll get is homeostasis. So you have dense networks that tell the guide living beings, yeah, you're doing well or you don't do well. Right? You, you're moving yeah, in the right direction. You're, you're moving away from the right direction. So you're hungry, eat something. Um, it's hot, get to a colder area, and so on. The problem with that is organism specific. I mean, there are some things that are universal, but many things are very organism specific. For example, you know, how much CO2 can you handle? Um, you know, uh, naked uh, moles, for example, can handle much more CO2 than other animals. Or there are, for example, humans who can dive, I think, in you know, Indonesia or Philippines, forgot exactly where, they can dive for pearls, can stay underwater for 15 minutes or something like that. I, 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 I don't get, don't call, catch me on the precise number, but it's a huge amount, much higher than um, people from other areas. They have a gene that allows them to stay underwater for a long time. And so it's very organism specific. And the question, therefore, when you do artificial agents, how do you design it? You design it from case to case, you, every time you have to design it anew. In, in evolution, you have to discover it anew. That is, it works too well to have to be discovered every time anew, right? So the question is, is there more generalizable perspective? And the idea behind that is, yes, there is. And this perspective, and it's basically in car, um, it's considered like universal drives and utilities. So drives and utilities which always exist and can be always defined, even if you are um, whatever organism you are and on whatever level of evolution you are, they can be defined relatively easily. And the core idea is that adaptation of feedback that's generalizable should be dense and rich. What does it mean? It should be dense. Dense means you get it all the time, not just at the end. One problem with, with the your rewards that appear only can feedback by death, right? You don't get any reward. Nothing tells you where you're doing the right thing. And then you get a reward. Yes, you succeeded. You didn't succeed. End of story. So that's not dense. You want feedback all the time. When I'm standing, I want to know, oh, I'm, I'm falling, so I have to correct my foot. So I need to get 
feedback all the time to tell me, no, 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 I'm, I have to realign myself. So dense. Second, it should be rich. What does it mean? It's rich. It tells you what it's supposed to do, more or less. Right? It's not like, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no, 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 yeah, no. That is not rich. That's that's feedback. Yeah, it's like this game the children play, like hot and cold. Um, and as you can see, they can find it. It contains enough information to find objects, but it's not rich, right? It's it, it, if, if you would say, where's my where's my car key? And um, your wife will tell you, warm, cold, warm, cold. You would get upset. Said, just tell me where it is, right? And she says, yeah, it's on, on the cupboard, right? That is rich feedback. Rich feedback is highly informative feedback. So you want it to be dense. So getting feedback all the time and rich, it should be high quality feedback. So different approaches have been suggested. Artificial curiosity, learning progress, the autotelic principle, intrinsic rewards by various people. And there, there are many more by now. It has taken off quite a lot, this area. Um, free energy, homeokinesis, predictive information, uh, and other principles that have been used. Probably the closest to what I'm talking about here uh, is the causal entropic forcing, which is actually uh, has been physically motivated. The concept that we are talking here is actually more evolutionarily motivated. Let's have a look. So the ansatz we are saying is we have an inf informational impedance match. You will remember I talked about information structure of the world. And we said the information flows that go through the world, they are, they are modulated by the world. And what an organism tries to do in terms of evolution, it wants to make the most out of this flow, right? So if I'm an organism, I have a sensor, I pay for this sensor. The sensors are expensive. And the sensor should pick up something I care about. It should not pick up something I don't care about. So for example, if I'm an organism that lives in a dark cave, um, a sensor that sees a visual sensor doesn't make much sense because there's nothing I can pick up with, right? I can do all kinds of stuff. You can splash around and the splashing, I can hear it. Or if I have a line organ in the, in the fish, that makes sense. But seeing doesn't make sense. Unless as deep sea fish do, you can generate light. So the effect of your action can be picked up again. So you have two solutions, either get rid of the sensor, which cavefish do, they don't have a visual sensor anymore. It, it, they have eyes, but they don't work. Or you do the, like the deep sea fish, which find a more powerful solution. They actually create the light necessary to make the sensor work again. The reason that deep sea fish can do that is simply they have a, live a much bigger environment where there are bacteria that can generate light and they use these bacteria. The cave fish didn't have the luxury and therefore never evolved this solution. But these are two viable solutions. So you either forgo the sensor that doesn't give you any feedback or you get um, um, your sensor back into the niche by making the feedback possible again. In other words, you want the actuations to be picked up or pick upable by your sensors. This is the idea. So you want to maximizing, and this is the postulate that we are making, to maximize the potential to inject information to the environment via the actuators. You want to be able to modify an environment and recapture it from environment via sensors. If you modify the environment beyond what your sensors capture, that's not a modification that you care about because you can't control it. If you want to capture stuff that you can't change, it doesn't change at all, that's also not the sensor you need. There may be still things that drive your sensor up so we can watch the stars, even if we can't move them. Um, and, but that is a side effect of some other effects, which I, I can't talk about that right now. So there are additional effects, but we say you, essentially as an organism, you want to have a, a balance between the fact that your actions do something in the world which can be picked up by your sensors. And when you have that, you want to be in niche where this is optimal. So you don't want to be a niche where the actuators and the sensors are misaligned. So in a very simple motto, um, basically motto, um, and the, this has been suggested by Tobias Jung, is being in control of one's destiny is good. So you want to be in control of your environment and you want to know about that. So want to be able to change your environment and you want to see the change. If you can't see the change, it doesn't count. 
Okay. And this is essentially a term that we took for it. It's actually coming out from psychology and social, social science. It's empowerment. Because empowerment is exa exactly about that. Being able to change your environment and knowing that you can do so in a way it is a counter, counter case to um, helplessness. It's the opposite of helplessness in a way. So let me skip this uh, formal thing. Um, let me explain how it is actually done mathematically, just uh, um, an idea. This was work that was uh, done by Alexander Klubin um, uh, and, and uh, with Christopher Nan, uh, but Alexander was a PhD student that did that. Um, he um, basically pioneered, pioneered this approach. Um, since then there have been a lot of variations. So we have a Bayesian network again, as before, this is the world. And there's a sensor and you go through the memory, the memory decides on which action to take a new state of the world and so on. We have seen that before the, the flow looks a little bit different. Now we get rid of the memory. So this is a purely reactive agent. Now I'm getting rid of the direct link between sensing and acting. Okay, now this is the network that I'm going to look at. And formally what I'm going to look at, I'm going to pick an action at a different time and I, see what it can do to the world. So I take, like picking up a, 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 a brick and I throw it onto the, onto the glass house, <laughs> okay? And well, I wait, a t sorry, I wait a time, time passes, and now I do the same thing again. I throw a second brick. I wait one more step, I throw a third brick, and then I observe what I've done. I look, okay, yeah, I managed to break the glass house. Okay, so what I did here is one action, second action, third action, observation. I can also observe in between, it gets more complicated. Let's, we don't need that. We can make do very well with what we have now. So action, 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 observation at the end. And now you ask, okay, what's the most effect I can have from the actions I pick? onto the final observation. So I'm basically, I call it, I know this philosophically is very loaded, but think, don't, don't think of it too complicated. Basically free will actions just mean that I could choose any actions I want and they are co-distributed. So the actions A1, A2 and 3 can be depending on each other. And they will in general also, the choice of them will depend on where I start. So I start in a given state and depending on the state I'm starting in, I'm picking the distribution of actions A1, 2, 3 and measure the effect on S and maximize that. I'm asking how much at most could I do to the final state and observe. This maximum is a quantity that depends on the starting state only, right? It's actually acquired by assuming that this is a starting state. I'm asking, okay, what's the most that if I start in the starting state, my actions could actually impinge on the final state. It's not what I'm doing. It's what I could do. Imagine money. If you have money, I have a million. I'd say, what can I buy with a million? I can buy you know, a nice car. I can buy a house. I can uh, probably not in London, but, but somewhere else, right? Um, I can uh, buy a... Um, <clears throat> Um, um, uh, do a big parties, I could do this, 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 this. Once I do it, it's gone, right? But, but the point is this, I can put it in the bank to save it. So it is a potential. It's not what I'm doing. And I'm asking what's the potential I can do. If I give you $1 or one, one pound, then it's much less you can do. Okay, again, I'm not saying you're spending it. You can keep it in your pocket, but you have the option of spending it on certain things and it's much less than you would be able to, to do with a million. So this is a potential. And this quantity we call empowerment, it's measured in bits, because it's in mutual information, so it's measured in bits. And when it's high, that's a good thing. So you want to move to states where your empowerment is high. That is what we postulate organisms do when they don't have a very clear um, a very clear um, uh, drive, like eating or anything like that. So when the drives are not that clear, when it's not clear what to do, then you want to position yourself in a state where your options are maximal. That's the postulate. And once you do that, 
you endow your environment with a form of meaning. It's not semiotic meaning yet because we have not classified it. Of course, we could now apply, apply our previous idea of um, extracting the memory and distinguishing states and trying to find out what states have uh, give us the most information about empowerment and so on, and then create basically these symbolic, symbolic uh, extractions. But right now, I'm just talking about where does the meaning emerge from in the first place. Note, nobody created this meaning. There is an agent, the agent is embodied in the world. With this, the world has ups and downs in terms of empowerment. That creates meaning. And I would like also to mention one more thing, right? If you, uh, for example, have a world where your empowerment is, you can essentially ultimately reach every state in the world after some time, then the whole empowerment landscape is flat. So we call that the tragedy of the Greek gods. So the Greek gods could do everything. So the life was very boring because it had no meaning, right? It is, everything's flat. And that's why, you know, these gods went down and used human avatars, which had a stake. They would be able to die. Their life was not easy, but it would structure the landscape. There were things they could do and there are things they could not do. That creates the basically landscape, the, the um, profile of meaning in the, in the environmental landscape. So the key thing about all this, everything that we have here, the most important thing, we have no reward function required. All we need is the dynamics of the world. That's all we care about. And in fact, empowerment is a measure of how many distinguishable futures can the agent choose. So empowerment is high if the agent can choose between different futures, very different futures. If he can't, empowerment is low. When you just follow it inexorably uh, preordained fate, there's no empowerment. Here's a contradiction to the to the to the Greek Greek model of mythology, but again, um, they may not not everything matches. So give me so I, I give you some other interpretations. Um, so in games, for example, mobility. How many moves can you make? How many different states can you reach in your current state? And there are many games where mobility is a big advantage. Money, I mentioned that already. If you have more money, you have more options. It doesn't mean you use them. It just means you have them. Affordance. I can do things. The doing of things, I'll have an example for affordance in a second, creates meaning in your environment. Um, perceivably different outcomes, efficiency divergence, which is actually a concept introduced by Österreich already in 79. Um, and I mentioned that already, antithesis to helplessness. So helplessness means I, I believe anything I do doesn't make sense. And the empowerment is the opposite. It, it's saying, I can do these things. This is what I can do. And I want to st go to states where I can do more. So here's a nice example where, very simple example. Again, I love the grid words because they're so simple and nevertheless the phenomena um, become clear there. So here's a world and this world has a um, box and this box sits in the middle. And we first look at a stationary box. So the box cannot be moved. And the agent can be in any location of this world and can make five steps, north, east, south, and west. And basically, empowerment here is very simple. How many states can the agent reach in five steps? Distinguishable states. We assume there's no noise. Empowerment can handle noise, no problem. But here, we assume there's no noise. So it's just counting states and taking the logarithm. And as it turns out, that if you have an agent, when the agent is far away from the box, um, it can move to 61 states. And uh, this is very, um, it's, it's black. Black means it's maximum empowerment, which is roughly six bits. That's uh, roughly 61, 61 states that it can reach. When it approaches the box, the box is a, an obstacle because it's stationary, it can't be moved. And when it can't be moved, it will take away degrees of freedom from the agent. So you see that as the agent approaches the box, um, the values of empowerment go slightly down. That's why it's brighter here. And the white areas where the box is a real obstacle. It really limits what the agent can do. And you see now that when the agent is at the top of the box, what it can do, it can drop down from the box and then continue stuff. So at the top of the box, it has, again, it's full degrees of freedom. So it gets a little bit more degrees of freedom because it can drop down. It has its choice. Now, in the case of the stationary box, it really doesn't matter whether you see the box or not. 
So as long as the agency is itself, you get exactly the same empowerment profile because the box essentially doesn't move. So whether you see changing or not, you don't care. You only care where the agent is. Okay, now let's look at the pushable box. What's a pushable box? It means when you encounter the box, you can push it in different directions. Let's look at the boring case. The box is invisible to the agent. So you don't see where the box is. You can only see yourself. And then very easy, the pushable box cannot be distinguished from, an, from just not a box at all. Right? The agent can move around everywhere and has six, uh, six bits of, of um, empowerment because it can just move anywhere from any starting position. The box is basically non-existing for the agent. Now comes the interesting one. Pushable box, but the box is visible. So the box, the agent can see both itself, its own position, and the box's position. And when you do that, you see suddenly, and this is rescale, all the pictures have their own scaling. This is rescale, you see that empowerment now starts at 61 bit because the box is pushable. You can reach 61 states always. But when you are close to the box, this is when you are close to the center, you get almost two bits extra. What does it mean? You have a mountain of empowerment around the box because now the agent cannot just move itself. It can also move the box. And this, essentially, the agent is now attracted to the box in terms of empowerment. Empowerment tells it the box is an interesting object to manipulate. And of course, now you can create a context detector that says, okay, I'm in a world where I can't reach a box versus can reach a box. Suddenly the box becomes an object of meaning, right? This is not a hard semiotic statement at the end, right? You would have to filter it through some kind of, you know, a symbolic or information, information bottleneck like we did before. But this tells you how you would discover, oh, this is an object. And this object should be named and get its get get its own its own conceptual uh, conceptual uh, treatment. And empowerment here tells you having an object that you can manipulate with visible effects is something worth considering as something interesting. And if you look at video games, that's exactly how they work. In video games, things you can't modify don't are not very interesting. In video games, you want to see, okay, there's grenade launcher or this health kit or something. These things can do things. And this is what you're interested in, things that you can change, things that affect the way the world looks. Here is another one. Um, this is essentially a very nice example um, of how empowerment works. Empowerment, again, is, is a measure of how much you can do. When you have an agent, the agent dies, empowerment goes to zero because you can't do anything anymore. So maximizing empowerment is also running away from death in a way. And here is an example of what you can do. Here is a world, and this world is, just, uh, let me start it. This is a kind of Minecraft world. In this Minecraft world, you see a little a river. This is work with Christoph Saga. There's a little river of lava. So there's the agent that's blue. I'll just start it again. And the agent can move, um, destroy, uh, and then uh, move around blocks. And the agent has learned to put a bridge over the lava. So the agent has increased its own um, degrees of freedom by putting a bridge over the lava so it can cross to the other side. That's, a, of course, a nice little example, but we can make it a bit more interesting. So this one is a case where we have this agent living in this world, and now we are really nasty. We pour lava into the world, so we do global warming. A little bit more than global warming in this in this little example. And we pour the lava. The lava goes and the, the poor agent, it's a bit like a politician, uh, decides a little bit too late to do something, right? So the agent has a forward model of what will happen when it touches the lava. It knows it will die, but it didn't start early enough. So in the very last moment, it built a little island and stepped on the island to escape. Um, escape the lava. So this was one solution that we got, uh, see, and you see that the agent sits here and, and basically doesn't doesn't do much. Uh, but at least it didn't die. Okay. Then we have the same scenario, and some runs we get a slightly different outcome. Here's the one. You know, again, the lava is put in the world, and this agent again uses empowerment to decide the next move and build actually um um uh how to say um. um a dam and um, 
and the, a, a, a blockage um, a blockage against the lava, and so it has a little bit of degrees of freedom. It managed to protect itself from the on, on the coming flood of a hot hot substance. But my favorite one is the last one. It's a real fun one, and with this these results were not planned. Okay, so the lava comes, and where, where has the agent gone? Aha, it's underground. And underground put, puts a cork on the top of his uh, of his um, his caves and starts digging caves. Um, I should mention that, um, as we said, the agent is allowed to destroy matter, so it doesn't have to push push the matter out. Uh, it is allowed to destroy matter and basically now starts creating a cave system, uh, an apocalyptic cave system that protects it from the destruction of the world uh, above. Um, note, nothing of this is a hardcore concept in the world. All the agent knows is I want to maximize my empowerment, which is equivalent to survival. I want to maximize my degrees of freedom. And all the concepts that emerge in terms of digging or not digging and so on, they emerge from this embodied requirement. Right. So I would say, since my time has progressed quite a lot, I would just mention that we can also look at altruistic empowerment, um, empowerment that looks at the, what the empowerment of the other person is. And from there, we can model co cooperation, we can model um, alignment of agents with each other, and we can model antagonism I, too. Um, again, all these concepts emerge from the embodiment. And now you would, the, the next step, we haven't done that yet, is to feed them through a system where joint concepts emerge through information constrained interaction. And when we would do that, um, what we expect is that similar to what we saw in the very simple um, space classification example, you would get crisper and cleaner concepts emerge from the interaction of the, of the different agents. And I believe this may be a bottom up, a very, truly uh, and a generally bottom-up route towards understanding where semiotics may coming may be coming from. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor Daniel, thank you very much. Um, this has been a long and intricate presentation. Thank you for the examples. Uh, it has uh, um, elucidated the points uh, which you had uh, put forward. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, we will have a session for Q&A with the audience post the broadcast is off. For the moment, I'd like to announce that the next uh, event is on 16th June hosting Helen LeBlanc on the topic of formal sign in Coimbra. You are all welcome to uh, stay with, uh, with us um, uh, of the broadcast for Q&A session with Professor Daniel Polanyi.